recording, recording is on. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the monthly call on April 12th, 2023. Uh, we usually don't record these, but this week or this month, we've got a um, we've got Greg and Octavio from RSI and SurveyStack who have been doing some work on um, PharmOS convention schemas. So we figured we would record this one so that we could share it uh, with the rest of the community or folks who can't attend because I think it's going to be rich with information. Um, before we jump into that, I just want to kind of reintroduce what that is and what that means and sort of some of the context. So I'm going to share my screen here and um, just sort of kick this off. And then I'll hand it over to you, Greg, and you can introduce from there and introduce Octavio and go from there. So can you all see this? OK, cool. So this um, this is kind of the, the this is a forum topic called documenting conventions that started last year, uh, basically as a as a way to kick off this process in PharmOS of documenting what we what we have always sort of traditionally referred to as conventions. And so conventions are, um, if we go to pharmos.org and click on the data model here. Um, Basically, PharmOS provides like a, 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 a generalized and flexible architecture of record types, including assets, logs, quantities, files, users, those kind of things. And within that, there's different subtypes. So you have plant assets and animal assets and equipment assets. And within logs, you have activities and harvests and inputs and that kind of thing. And those, for the most part, can be very flexible to, to represent all kinds of different records. Um, which is great. I mean, it means like anyone can pick this up and start using it in the way that makes sense to them in their own mental model of their farm and their records. Where it gets tricky is when you want to have comparable data because it's so flexible in order to make sure that you your PharmOS data is comparable against someone else's PharmOS data, you have to follow conventions. You have to you have to establish some kind of pattern of like, if I'm doing an irrigation log, this is where I'm going to do it. I'll put it in as an input log, and I'll put in a quantity with this type of measure and this type of units. Basically, like setting up some some standard um, some standard specifications to follow. So. That's always been kind of an implicit process, meaning um, everyone kind of creates their own conventions internally within within their PharmOS instance. And now, as we're you know being able to aggregate data, and and Greg and Octavio have been kind of on the forefront of that. They're along with Survey Stack, which is one of the applications that they're working on. They're also working on something called the Farmer's Coffee Shop, which pulls in data from lots of PharmOS instances so that it can benchmark them and compare them against each other. But in order to do that, they need to be comparable too. So they've been really deep in the weeds of this um, convention idea and this comparability idea, and specifically in the schema representation of those. So it's machine readable comparability, essentially. Um, on the other end of things, I've been working on proposing ways for us to document conventions in written word, meaning basically like a specification that you can hand to someone like um, a farmer or a data scientist or a programmer and say, if you want to represent this kind of information, put it in in this way. So what that kind of looks like, if we jump back in the forum to, we created a new category in the forum. And the forum for anyone watching this later is farmos.discourse.group, where we do a lot of our discussions. We have a conventions category now. And um, in this quick links here, uh, this links to, to a bunch of stuff, including the original forum post I just showed. But also what I wanted to show was an example of the soil test convention. So this is kind of what a written convention, what we're proposing as what written conventions will look like moving forward. Basically, you know, they can be versioned so that they can change over time, but you'll track what version you used. They have a specific purpose. So a soil test is used to represent the act of collecting a soil sample, sending it to a lab, receiving results back, and storing that data for future reference. But then the specification is where it gets into the, the nitty gritty details of how to do that in PharmOS. So it'll say things like, must, soil test must be recorded as a lab test log. The test type field must be set to soil test. The timestamp must be the date when they were collected, blah, 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 blah. So it really just spells out like 
If you want this stuff to be comparable, always put it in in this way. So that's kind of what we've been working on on the PharmaOS core side. And then on the sort of in the wider community, Greg and Octavio have been working on the schemas. And I see these as sort of on convergent paths where eventually it would be great to be able to package both together. So you have you can provide a convention in a Git repository of some kind, which has both a written specification like this, as well as a schema that can be used to programmatically validate data to say, yes, this is following that convention, or no, there's some issues with it, um, and lots of other things. So I think that's the general, and I'll, now I'll hand it over to Greg to, to take it from there and cover anything I missed. Yeah, I'm just going to do just sort of continue the intro a little bit and background and then hand it to Octavio, who's going to go into the detail, uh, kind of what he's built and what we've laid out. So first, I think it's worth um, uh, talking about the PharmaOS API, because a lot of you may not use it. Some of you might use it. A lot of you probably haven't seen it. But it is really the, the sort of core of what we're building these conventions on top of. And that may not be a data model that you're familiar with, because you're using the UI, potentially, or the database directly. So um, let me just share my screen and share what that looks like. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Yep. OK. Oh, yeah. So okay. yeah, I'll zoom in a little bit also. So when you go to a PharmOS instance, you know, like this is kind of a test instance that we have. If you go to slash API, you can see essentially all the data from that instance based on the types. Right, so this initial list is just a list of all of the um, asset types, and then you can see files, the log types, and in each of these, if I click on a plant asset, I can actually go in and see all of my plant assets here in data. Right, so if I click on zero, that's a single plant asset with this ID. Um, it's funny because Mike just heard me give the spiel, um, but basically each object, like an, a plant asset, has attributes and relationships. Attributes is sort of the core information, like the name and the status, um, the notes, and then maybe some other key pieces of information. Um, and then relationships is references to other objects in the system. So um, for example, this is a plant asset that also has, well, this one doesn't, uh, but that could have a reference to a location. And if it did, then the location reference would, would be located here. Um, or it has a reference to an asset type, uh, which is here. So this is actually the structure that, that Octavio and I mostly deal with in PharmOS, almost less so than the UI, um, is this what it outputs in, the, in this API. So when we're talking about um, uh, creating conventions, what we're actually talking about is creating conventions around this data um, and specifying this data and sort of clarifying it so that it can be used in a repeatable way. Um, this is really useful both within PharmOS, but also for any systems interacting outside PharmOS to be confident that what they're getting, they can understand and it's consistent with a schema that they can then go find and replicate themselves. So um, when we're talking about Schemas from PharmaOS, this is what we're talking about. And in fact, if you ever want to look at these schemas, if you go to slash API slash schema, this was the data. What I was just showing you is the actual data in an actual instance. If you want to see the schema, you go to API slash schema, and then this gives you all of um, the available schemas in this instance. So let's go look at a plant asset here. If you're not familiar with, sorry, it's always two clicks in. If you're not familiar with schemas, I'm not going to go into all the detail, but basically this describes completely what could or should or must be in a plant asset. So you can see it has these properties. It has a name property, which should be a string. Uh, it has a description, right? So it's nice and clear and declarative of what it's supposed to be. It has a status property. And then some things are required if you go all the way down um, you can see name and status are the only two things required for a plan asset. So that's what JSON schema gives you. It gives you the ability to specify a type, to specify uh, if it's a list of items, what the list is. Um, 
It specifies what's required. It can specify some logic, like if this object is there, then these other objects must be there. Um, and it can specify some relationships. So um, it's really useful. Um, and it's not perfect. There's still components of a convention or the way that you use Form OS, which have to be described with words, but it does cover a lot. And, and that's our hope. So um, I'm going to let um, Octavio describe exactly how we're creating these conventions, but I want to sort of at the outset describe the why. Um, so what a convention gives you, for example, I could have a tillage convention, which might say, and I think Octavio is probably going to use this example, it might say an activity log which contains two quantities, one which is called depth and one which is called stir, and that's an intensity rating for tillage. That is a schema which describes those objects and their relationships, right? So what do I get from producing this, um, this schema that describes both these objects and these relationships? Well, one, we get uh, folders that are published to the web. We're using GitLab. We'll show that, um, which in which anybody can find these conventions and what we're calling overlays. An overlay is just taking an entity like a quantity, quanti standard quantity from FarmOS and making some additional specifications to it. So a standard quantity in FarmOS requires only, I think, like, actually, I don't, I don't even know if it requires anything. It might just require a label. Um, we may we, we may want to make a stir quantity, which is just like a standard quantity, but it requires the label equals stir, and it requires a value maybe between zero and hundred, right? We could make that. That could be an example overlay. It's just one entity from FarmOS that we just added some more specifications to. That's an, that's what we're calling an overlay. These words really matter because it gets confusing. What we call a convention is when you have more than one of these entities or overlays in relationship to each other. So in my tillage example, I could have a tillage log, right? In which I have some specifications and it says it requires two quantities, a stir quantity and a depth quantity. Those two quantities have a defined relationship with the tillage log. The convention, as we're describing it, is all three together. It's an object which contains all three of those things and describes also their relationship. That's a convention. So an overlay is a single entity which has been modified, it has its schema modified. Convention is multiple of those entities or, or the overlays together in a relationship. So one of the outputs of what you're going to see is that that schema is now public and published to the web in a clear way. The second thing that you get um, is that those overlays and conventions um, have JavaScript functions written such that anyone could use the function to validate an object. Let's imagine I'm a totally different system and somebody sends me an object and I'm using this set of conventions and overlays, which I say, this is how I describe my farm. Object comes in, how do I know if it's valid or not? Well, you get a JavaScript function for free that validates that object so you can determine not only if it's following your, your norms, your collection of overlays and conventions, but also if it's not, why? What's missing? Which parts? JSON schema does an amazing job of giving you feedback when something's not valid on what's not valid. So you get that. JavaScript functions to validate. And if you put information in the description, you're going to get documentation that's also published because GitLab, you can publish documentation as well. I don't know if Octavia, you're going to show that or not, but that's one of the outcomes. So yeah, in the minutes before we've got that. Yeah. So you're going to be able to. So, so again, what a schema gets you is not only does it give you effective documentation that's written and organized, but it also gives you the ability to validate using JavaScript and it gives you a publication mechanism to the web so that anybody can use it. Um, the coolest part is the JavaScript validation tools, actually all three of those things 
are then packaged into NPM so that you can create your own unique NPM package that anybody else can then use and install even in offline applications, which I think is really, really important for things like FieldKit um, or Asset Link or totally different or service stack for us. Um, so any, any, there was a lot there. And I know that we're using a lot of words and some words in different ways than people are used to. So I wanna just like pause for a second for questions in case there's common ones. Good. And uh, Greg, can I make one quick point? I just put it in the chat, but I, for the sake of the recording too. Yeah. Um, so one thing I sort of forgot to mention in the intro is that um, this this whole idea of conventions too is it is that they aren't necessarily going to be official conventions. We might have some like core farm OS conventions, mm -hmm. but the whole idea here is that people in the community can make their own and yes. publish them and say, hey, I made this one. What do you think? Does it work for you? Does it not? And if it doesn't, maybe someone makes a competing convention. But over time, the idea is this can be sort of a community process of convergence towards what works best and therefore over time get to be more and more comparable on the data too. So farm OS itself can't really be you know, the core project, I should say, can't really be super opinionated on that because we can't right. figure out what the right solution is to all this without working with everyone. Right. So this is also kind of a, a process that's gonna take some time and and yeah. So I, but I also, that's what's exciting about it to me too. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's, and then I'll hand it to you, Octavio. That's what's exciting about what we've been working on because creating a schema is kind of hard work. Like it's complicated to do, it's not always obvious, but we know the benefits, right? You get validation, you get documentation, you get effective publication, there's a lot of positives. So what Octavio has done is he's tried to simplify that process down into a GitLab repository in which the steps for creating the schema and the documentation are clear. They're very stepwise, they're logical, and the outputs kind of happen automatically through the CI pipeline. We're trying to simplify that down so everybody can do that. Go ahead, Vic, and then Octavia, you can take it from there. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in and say, like, for people who aren't this community, could you really quickly specify what the basic skills would be to put you in that category of anyone who could make a core convention? Yes. I, well, here, Mike, you go first on like a, on a, a words only convention, and I can talk sure. about the scheme basically. Yeah, so we've talked about this. We've gone back and forth about this in chat about what is kind of the bare minimum for making core conventions. And because schemas are, you know, require development skill to write, I think we're we've kind of landed on the fact that bare minimum is just a written markdown file, basically just a written document within that structure that I sort of showed earlier with a purpose, specification, a version, that kind of stuff. But then other things can be you know, kind of add-ons to that. So if someone else then takes that and says, hey, here, here's a schema for that, then that can be packaged together too. So it can be kind of a collaborative process moving forward. But I think the, you know, the bare minimum is to be able to have a, a written specification as a guide, I think. So yeah, that's right. If you want to create a schematized convention, I, and when I'm going to take what Octavia has done and assume we continue that for another month or two, right? So I'm going to describe where I think we'll be in a month or two. Um, we've basically, you need the ability to read JavaScript. You don't need to be a JavaScript developer. You, we have some helper functions, basically maybe four, five, six, seven that do most of the work. Set as required, uh, set as defined, uh, add a list. Most of the stuff you need to do in a convention is that kind of stuff. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so I think once we have those things complete, you need to be able to read JavaScript, be comfortable with something like a JSON object so you can look through stuff. Uh, and then um, and, and then I, I think you can really do it. So I think like you absolutely could do it as an example um, with some basic training. That's the goal. That's our goal. Maybe I can jump in um, really quickly. Uh, I think it might have been clear already from what um, Mike was saying, but um, that like you could kind of uh, incrementally build these up. You could have the first step be somebody writes kind of an informal definition of what data you're trying to collect um, as plain text in a Word document or whatever, and then 
as people start using it, the next step would be um, like writing a little bit more formal definition still in plain English, but that conforms to this written specification format that Mike was talking about. And then as you want to start sharing the data and validating it, you could do what Greg's talking about and build out the uh, the um, like technical schema that uh, that can be programmatically validated. Exactly. Yep. Um, we have a request in the chat to include to just post the GitHub link for. Um, actually, uh, yeah. What what GitHub link do you want? Is that the for the what um, uh, what Greg was showing earlier? Was that on GitHub or GitLab? That was on GitHub, but I think the better link. I have kind of some of my own notes. That was just for my reference. I wouldn't worry cool. too much about that. I would reference. I just the sent. The, I just sent the link to the repo. We are intending to share today. Yeah. And this is and still I'll, in process, uh, just to clarify also. We I think we, we got a good start, enough to present, but um, we will continue to improve it. So. I'll also just drop in the chat that quick links uh, forum topic. So maybe we can add some more stuff to that in the comments as well. Cool. All right, Octavio, take it away. Yeah. OK, uh, I, I wanted to add like that uh, we also chose to start with the schemas uh, instead of written, you know, instead of written conventions, because when you work with the API, uh, you know, the, the, the role the schemas offer when you begin with is they reject stuff. That, that's your interaction with them. So in order to, to get the most positive benefits from them, you need to work a little and use validation on your end so you can see meaningful errors, etc. And we are sending quite some complex data into PharmaOS and it's I wanted to show this because I believe it's it's illustrative. Like if you look here, like this is one of our farms. This is an example farm. It's not even like there should be way more information. This is lab test logs. And these, for example, are fairly complex. Look here, each not even each line. Uh, there's like three entities for each line here. Like this is tens of entities. And if even one of these fail, like the whole submission fails. So we need to, this is the kind of complex use cases we wanted to cover. Uh, that said, the, the way this is structured, I believe in a way it's, uh, it, it might become a tool to democratize the usage and the creation of schemas because it's in such a way that you can just clone the repo and start publishing your own conventions with almost zero further effort. As Greg said, if you know the bare minimum about JavaScript, I believe you could learn how to write conventions really fast. Like I believe it reduces it to the minimum effort you will need because you need to be familiar, for example, with the core uh, PharmaOS entity types. And you'll always need that. Like there's no way of getting around of that. And it's almost the only thing you need. I would like to show uh, first how a simple schema looks and how the validation looks like and then we'll move into what we've built because again as everything is incremental i believe starting with a simple example could be good so i prepared uh, this tiny example uh, here give me one second uh, simple schema let me make the font bigger so let me open it. Uh, I'm using something that here that I show in a minute, but what I want to say about this is um, what we are using here is just the JSON validation, which I show how it was built in a second. And this is how the schema looks like. Uh, I said land schema. This is the same thing Greg showed before. Give me a minute. I, I want to see if I can make it look prettier so we can read it. Yeah, this is the schema again. This is the same thing Greg showed us before in the website. And I got one of the things this repo does is it will go, uh, you, you'll point it to a farm, uh, which we are doing here. Uh, ah, I, can I can't open it because it has a secret, but uh, there's a variable I've stored in which I gave it 
the address of a farm. So in, in a place, it, it looks like So I just I just want to I just want to state this so it's super clear. So step mm -hmm. one in this in this GitLab project is you point to a farm and you say give me all of the entities that that farm makes. Uh, give me all of the schemas that that farm produces. Remember that slash schema page that I went to that had that whole list of schemas. It pulls in all of those into your in your GitLab instance. So they're kind of your starting point reference to build on top of for your schema. If you're going to make your customized land uh, asset schema, you're going to you're going to modify that base land asset schema. So that's why we pull them all in as a reference. Yeah, that's explains a lot of documentation. It's all here, and in here it explains that you need to tell your GitHub or GitLab. Uh, provider, you can declare variables, and one is farm domain. So this is, will be your source farm. And what this do is, this one, you know, this activates tasks which happen uh, on the repo, which are called uh, continuous integration. And in this case, uh, I linked here also the results from mine. So you can see, um, each schema. So one of the things it does is the publishes all the organized folders. So you know instead of I think you're breaking up Octavio, I think you're breaking up. Maybe turn off your video. Better. Uh, we could all we could all okay. probably turn off our videos too. Yeah, I don't know if that imagine. helps. But, yeah. Uh, somebody told me that report. Can you hear me now? By the way. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds good. That the repo might not be public. Checking that. That's it's prepared to be perhaps forgot to share it. One second. That should be an easy. I get maybe. Sorry, of yeah, that should have been public from default. I just made it public. It should be public now. Just refresh your page. Oh, great. Sorry about that. I don't know why that was. Uh, um, I, I'll share my video again. Let's see if it works now. Ah, oh, I'm sharing. What, what, what we want is the screen. Sorry about that. It should be better. Um, so we are published. One of the things this does is you will retrieve all schemas from your farm and share them in that link. This is always the latest version of what you've retrieved. Uh, so let's go again. That's this latest version of discrete schemata. Uh, and this is the schemas only. But the other thing it will do automatically is it will publish an NPM package that is a JavaScript package, which is we need to use for everyone in this repo, which you can download. And I'll show you how it works now. Like what I have down here is a, an extremely simple project in which, you know, the only thing I installed was the package, the package that gets published uh, when you run, when you create the repo. And it, it publishes two things. This only validates your basic schemas. So what I'm doing here is I, I get the code for the general validator. And what I'm doing is I created a, I created a, an, an entity, a, you know, something that is supposed to go into PharmaOS. And then I ask this validator if it really is an asset land uh, entity, right? This is my example, which is an empty object. So it should have plenty of errors. It's missing 
everything it should have. And I, if I run the validation, it will tell me that it's false. So it's not a land asset. And if I look into the errors, and this is the interesting part, it will tell me exactly what I should do to get a valid uh, example. So let's create another example and follow the instructions. Uh, and we know we need, can you see we need um, a name, a status, and a land type. So let's do name. Uh, um, I believe this is active. I don't remember. We can see later. And this is uh, land type. Uh, let's try it with this. So this is valid, right? And we'll have no errors. And this is basically what we intend to do with everything here. The interesting part is getting these validators to work is not extremely easy. And now it only requires, you know, just calling a package. That's it. In fact, we are also offering a browser version of this. With, I know this looks hideous, but it's prepared for the browser, not for us. And you can import this in whatever web application and just run it in it. For example, we use it uh, when we run scripts in service stack before sending information into Pharma OS, again, to ensure it's valid. And if it isn't to know what failed with this detailed error format we see here. Uh, so that's the first portion of the project, really. It retrieves everything from a farm. It creates automatic validators. And it serves everything for anyone who wants to use it. And as you can choose which farm to use, your farm could have special schemas or special types of entities. And this will make it easy for everybody to work with you. Then we wanted to do the same thing with the conventions. So we tried, and that's why I show now, we tried to design a format for conventions. We, this is all explained here, how to work with it. Uh, we created a library which helps you write conventions. And each time you create a convention, it will do the same. It will also um, compile a validator, publish the schemas for everybody to see them, etc., to make it as, as open and easy to use as possible. Uh, so I, I wanted to show you how we create the, the schemas. To do that, uh, we've got a helper library so tillage give me one second i've been using this a lot today um i believe it's this no it does not exist anymore um give me one second here it is so this is a script in which i'm building a schema and even though it might look daunting if you are not used to code we are really just repeating the usage of the same functions over and over. Uh, we, and this even is a good base to create a graphical uh, convention creation tool. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm again importing the tools and we made this even easier because I showed you later we created an environment in which you can work without installing anything. Uh, and there's really two types of uh, JavaScript classes you need to work with. And these correspond roughly to the concepts Greg uh, explained before. With, we create schema overlays and we create convention schemas, schemata. These are the two things you need to work with. And I, I hope this is quite intuitive. The idea is, for example, we chose again, uh, we want to define a tillage log, right? And it, it really would involve more entities. And I'll, I'll show you 
is, if time is enough, an improved version of this, this one, in fact. Uh, but the idea is, to begin with, uh, it, as Greg said, is a, an activity log of the type tillage, uh, and it will have two quantities. In reality, quantities always require uh, also to be paired, for example, to units uh, and to the value. So, in fact, it, it's, it should be longer, but this one is enough to show how it works, and otherwise, it, it, I feel it would be confusing. So the first, the main thing we need is the convention schema, right? Which is the, the entity encompassing everything. But we already said it's gonna be made up of pieces, right? Of um, uh, other entities, which are gonna be its parts. Uh, so the convention is a new, new thing, which does not exist currently in PharmaOS, and it's a, a it's an entity for which every attribute is an entity of the classes created by PharmaOS. The overlay, by the other hand, is as Greg said, what you get if you grab a known uh, class of of entities from PharmaOS. And let me get. The font bigger, I believe this is hard to read. Uh, and you add details to it because you want to make it more specific. Uh, in this case, to get a stir quantity, the first thing we want to do is set the label to the only possible value of stir. So it's set constant to stir. And this is one of the operations we've got. Um, is, is, can you hear me? I, I, yeah. I've been looking at my own screen for a lot of time and I fear I might be talking. No, 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 about, let's sorry. finish. Uh, I can, let, let, just share your screen again. Let me, let me help you finish that through because I, I want to make not, sure we have time. Is, 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 can you see my screen now? No, I think you stopped sharing. Oh, how do we go? There you go. Now you're back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, so um, this is a so there's two basic operations you need to do, which are setting constants and setting enums. So this will allow you to grab the original schema you had and change stuff. In fact, I would like to show that if I create this uh, stir quantity, I, I haven't done it yet. It has quite some attributes, as you can see. This is well documented. I'll show you later. We publish each time we modify it, a nice HTML document you can look into, and we'll add further tutorials. But one of the most important things is you have at hand what you need. So if you look at base schema, this is the schema for just any, um, what's this, any uh, entity of the standard quantity, right? They all look like this. What we can do in an overlay is we always need to follow these constraints. We can be more specific. We cannot change it fundamentally. Otherwise, it will not be useful to communicate with other people. Uh, so what I'm doing here is, and we typically care about the attributes. This is the part we care about. In this case, we want to add, sorry, pro, uh, we need to look at the properties for that. Uh, sorry, uh, let me see. Here it is. We've got a uh, value and the label, as you can see, and we are setting them to fix, uh, right? The label is stir and the value is, is the type of thing you are measuring in this uh, occasion, it's a ratio. I, I did this wrong. And then for depth, we grab, this is interesting because we grab again, the, that, so this exemplifies really what an overlay is. We start again with quantity standard, but in this occasion, the label is set to depth and the uh, measure is set to length. Uh, and we can also set a main description. And this is important because as Greg said, we intend this to be self-documenting. If you store enough information here, it should be able to produce 
a document looking almost uh, like what Mike has shown to us. Um, another feature this has is it, it's full of errors. Like it will complain, it will try to protect you from, from doing unexpected things by creating a lot of errors. For example, if I try to change again an attribute I've already changed, it will tell me, like, can you see? The attribute measure has already been modified. Uh, you are overwriting a previous change, which invalidates it, etc. So please, if you want it, do it only once. Um, and you can see, I, I guess, to keep on what's important, like it also has a schema. This is the, the resulting schema, right? And you can see that it looks way different to base schema. It has more information. This is the base schema, right? And the new version, for example, has a description, right? This is stir, so it must be labeled as stir and its measure type, its ratio. See documentation? Ah, I forgot to, well, this should be a link, sorry, to get the standard specification for this ratio. Um, this is because stir is defined, I believe, by the USDA. So I wanted to add that there, and you can do it. It's just I forgot. Uh, then the title, for example, the attributes are not fixed. Now fixed, I mean, as we said. So this is the kind of thing you can do with the overlays. And it has something I love also, and it's, it's self-testing. If you provide, uh, you can provide uh, some of your values. You can provide uh, examples, both valid and errors. And it will uh, test against them. And it will let you know if it's working as expected. Let me finish this example and we'll see one. So to recap, we created two overlays to feed our tillage uh, convention. These are stir quantity and depth quantity. We need more, but this is an example, I believe. Perhaps, I hope good enough. Now I will create an example of how a tillage log should look like. So this is like what I would send when I want to inform a tillage log. This I will use for testing. I just wrote this by hand but I intend to give you tools to also create the examples uh, without needing to imagine them. So in this case, it will have three main attributes, tillage log, a stir quantity, and a depth quantity. Each one of these is a PharmaOS entity. I just gave them a name, which in my opinion should be the function they fulfill in the convention. Uh, because again, you might have repeated types as with the quantities. So I, want, I like to use the function. In this case, I provided the attributes the, which are required by the overlays. For example, the quantity, of course, is labeled as stir. Uh, and I also wrote the relationships because we also can test if they are properly related, which is very important for complex conventions, like the one I've shown you, right, with the lab test log, which is like 30 different entities. Uh, and we also created an error. It's important to always test both for the, a properly written entity and also errors because one of the most common problems with schemas is not that they reject what you want to accept, but that they let go through what you want to reject. So it's very important to test against some errors to see if it's working as expected. This one, I don't remember what, I, we'll see what's wrong when I run the, the schema. I don't remember what I changed. So now I'm creating another type of entity, and this is a convention schema. Uh, it needs to be fed with some things like the name you intend to give to the schema. We haven't decided on a convention or how to name conventions yet. Uh, the repo URL, which is used for the IDs, a version, because Mike wanted them to have versioning, a title, and a description again, because we want it to be self-documenting. Uh, and also, as you can see, these are the examples. The two examples I've shown you before are provided here when creating it. I don't remember where I was, so I had to go back and feed all of this to the thing. And again, uh, you can go adding stuff until it, it looks as you intend. So in this case, we add attributes to it each attribute is one of the overlays we've created. So we do it thrice, one for the tillage log, one for the stir quantity, one for the depth quantity. 
For each one, uh, you need to provide an attribute name, which is uh, this word you see here, right? Like how the attribute is going to be named on the topmost level. It should follow its function, in my opinion, uh, so you can understand what it means. And you can also add in here a comment. Yeah, I haven't done it in this document. I, I, I hope I have time to show a more complete one. Uh, then you also need to add the relationships. Uh, I, I try to make it as easy as possible. Again, it will give informative errors if you try to create experience relationships. And this was all the work, really, right? It, pointing it to the proper places and telling it, yeah, the, the tillage log should mention the two quantities. This is what we are doing here. There's a container entity, which is the tillage log. There's a relation name, a field under which the relation is going to be stored, which is quantity. And it's mentioning stir quantity. Then we do the same for depth, and that's all. Yeah, yeah. I think Mike, Mike wanted to make sure we had time for discussion, so I think oh, that's I, I'm about to finish, anyways. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, So we... if you call test examples, it will test against the examples and let you know if the ones you intended to be valid are valid. You'll get a success. If the ones you intended to be errors are false, you get a success, and it will let you know that it's basically doing what you intend. Then you can store it, and it will generate the validators, the documentation, etc., and publish them on the web, as we've shown. That's it. Sorry. That was great. No, thanks so much, Octavio. It's really great to see the the details there. Yeah, we've we've got about nine minutes left so i wanted to leave some room for for discussion and q a and i'm sure there's there's a lot i i see there's already a bunch of questions in the chat um does anyone want to just uh bring up one or two of those while we have time feel free I, i'm not sure if the chat will get captured in the recording or not i was just um a bunch of questions, but all kind of leaning towards um, the issue of like publication and versioning and like making those things available um, for download. Um, on it, well, NPM was the thing that came up, but but more generally, you know, the, where the scheme is full. Like well, the question, Jamie, the first one I can see about the rationality of packaging the convention. This is to provide people who don't want to go that deep into JavaScript. Uh, with a thing that you can just call and validate. And for your exact, uh, you know, it's completely tied to just one version of the conventions and the uh, farm uh, schemas. And it's totally immediate. You call the package and you are validating. So you don't need to do anything. AJV requires a lot of steps to get you there. So we thought it was worth doing it right. in order to democratize it and make it more immediate. And I believe there's this impression that you... Sorry, my, my, like, I feel like you need to convince people to use the schemas. And make, uh, we intend to make it as easy as possible to see if we can get more people in and show them the real value in using the schemas. And the, so are the schemas being, like, is there a mechanism to make sure that they get published together? Yeah, everything gets published together. We oh, publish okay. like the schema yeah. in a JSON format plus the JS validator and even the objects I was showing you before, in case somebody wants to work on the same system. Oh, okay, and it just it just gets like to a link that would be like in the it's in the artifacts. It gets published as artifacts in GitLab, so which, which is linked in the readme. Right. Okay, I think I lost that. Yeah. yeah. So what's nice, you know, it's possible that we could. We've talked about this. It's a little more transparent to just save things directly back to the file system in the GitLab repository because that's kind of in the GitLab UI, really easy to see. But um, artifacts are also nice and they work, they're publishable. You can reference the latest artifact or a versioned uh, artifact that's been produced before. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to that too. So I think there's certainly, you know, willing to take feedback on how those publications should emerge. Um, yeah. Um, cool. Thanks. Yeah. 
And uh, Paul, Paul had a really good point or question about, um, you know, what what might this look like in something other than JavaScript? Uh, yeah, like Python. I believe it's almost the same, really. Like yeah. you you grab the schema because we are always we we were very careful as when working with Pharma OS to be very close to the original specs. So all the time there's a JSON schema, and that's the universal language. So you won't be able to use our schema creation tools. But each time, at each time, we are, you know, giving you a JSON schema, and that's something you can work with whatever tools you want in Python. You, you know, currently the tool is so lean that I could even port it to Python with very little effort. But that probably yeah. will change in the future. Yeah, cool. That's yeah. good to know. Definitely. Yep. And 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 I think it's also you know valuable, and I think you know some of you guys have done this already, but like the core. Um, the, the core elements that you push to a farm OS API or pull from it, you really can almost build out a snapshot of a farm from those things. So when you think about not only like, can I make this GitLab repo in Python rather than written in JavaScript, you certainly could. But I think this also enables farm uh, data coming from farm OS instances to be just consumed so much more effectively by any other external service for any reason. I'm curious if the um, if the schemas are published to kind of a canonical location so that, um, mm -hmm. you know, it seems like you guys are building on top of farm OS's schemas by downloading them from the, the farm, you know, the farm in question, its schemas. Right. Um, but then in turn, if somebody, um, let's say, kind of going with what Paul was talking about, if somebody were building on top of these schemas, um, what, where would their tooling point at? Would they, yeah. <laughs> would they be pointing at some canonical location or would they need to have like a UUID embedded in their URL that's pointing at a specific package version on GitLab? Yeah, I just brought, we just talked about this yesterday. Um, well, so first, um, the farm OS URL isn't the only um, location that you'll be able to point to. The goal here is to also be able to point to other GitLab um, schema sch schemas, right? Other people's collections, right, in other GitLabs, so you can pull from that. But yeah, the goal shouldn't be to sort of daisy chain linkages. It should be to uh, always reference a canonical source if a canonical source is being referenced. So I shouldn't be referencing your um, I should be referencing your schema overlays more than your entities from FarmOS, if that makes sense. I don't know if it, yeah. Um, I think more specifically, I was saying um, that if somebody wants to uh, make a subset of somebody else's existing convention, mm -hmm. so like, yeah, that, that, that's the idea. Yeah extending that's a convention published by our site and then saying even more specifically for our farm we want to um we want to enforce this additional thing yep um yeah then, you can in a way that because you know, obviously sorry. you could just have a separate convention that also gets applied to those entities but there's probably scenarios where you want it to be kind of uh composed of that's right that's why we call them overlays. Yeah, that's what, yeah, we, that's what we call them overlays. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. exactly. You can have many layers of them. Nothing yeah. stops you. And we are providing, again, like the three things. You can get a JSON schema and keep improving or changing it, which would require the exact same tools and steps. Uh, and you can even, you know, get the object we created with these features and keep adding features to it with really minimum effort. Uh, there's many ways in which to track that also in the schemas. The main is using references, the ref, ref attribute in JSON schema. Uh, but, you know, it's a huge topic. Like, we should probably pick a strategy. Yeah. And we felt also like waiting to be here and hear other people's opinion opinions was important. But I would say there's many ways to do it currently, not even only one. Well, and, and one warning too, or consideration that I think y'all are pretty familiar with is um, I think people are going to have to be thoughtful about um, how they create these overlays in the same way that you have to be thoughtful about how to create modules in Firm OS. You know, if you have a whole bunch of work to do um, and you want other people to be able to use your work, 
you may not just want to chuck that all in one gigantic module, right? You may want to think about how to parse it so that people can use submodules, even if they're not going to the level of detail you are in the end. And it's very similar with these schema overlays. Um, so, yeah. Great. Well, I just want to be mindful of time here. We've got about 20 seconds left until the top of the hour. Um, we, we can feel free to keep going beyond this. I, and if people want to drop off, they can, or we could uh, wrap it up here. If, I'd be curious if anybody does want to stick around. I'd love to hear feedback on, like, are there uses or applications or changes, things that you think we're, we're, we're missing, all that kind of stuff. So sorry we kind of pack the time in. But also, no, and, this time. Well, and the other thing I should mention, just in case we do drop off now, is that um, I'm going to try to take this recording and put it into a blog post and create a forum topic so that we can kind of have some asynchronous uh, feedback opportunity, too. So we'll try to like publish that out after all this, too. So if anyone does need to drop, you can always kind of check in on that as soon as we have that up. That would be lovely. Yeah. I also intend to record a video creating because Mike, you had some examples you used for your. I intended to to record myself creating those to also have like a tutorial on how to write a convention using this method. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it. I think it. Um, you know, we you talked about the the possibility of automatically generating the markdown from this stuff Ah, that too. is there. I didn't have time to show it, but it, it yeah. was created. Oh, cool. OK. Yeah, so, so I think that that's pretty powerful, too, because then it, it just allows these things to happen from either end, really. Like, if right. you're more comfortable developing the schema first, but then you can yeah. use that to generate the written documentation and the written specification. That's a Yeah, cool that's idea. what we thought. Yeah, and in fact, if you are somebody who does not code, but you asked a developer to transform your text into a JSON schema, then you can look at the documentation and see how effective they were, because you would see if it looks similar to what you've written. Or oh, it looks different. yeah. Oh, that's can cool. You, um, Octavio, can you, um, do you, do you have some artifacts from a recently published version that we could look at those outputs? The um, documentation, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have one. Give me one second to, okay. to search for it. Is it is it in the existing? Um, uh, no, I haven't sent it because it, I finished it just before the meeting, and okay. it required you know running the CYs again. I got you. And okay. you, it, it was like you know a temporary thing to do. It would fail, and it was without nothing. This was generated basing on the tillage log, log I've shown during the, the talk. Uh, this is fairly basic. Uh, so what I would like it, what this is missing and I would like to add is it should look into the relationships and give levels of titles based on that. So I would like stir quantity and depth quantity to be subtitles and this to be a main title uh, so that you can understand what's nested with what. Uh, but basically this, this is it. This is how it looks like. This even links to the original description of the thing. I don't remember. So it even links to the original language. Ah, oh, it does. Here it, here it is. So this is the base for it. It, it still needs the, the nesting, in my opinion. That's the main feature it's missing. Uh, cool. Could you could you paste a link to that in the chat too, Octavio? I um, for some reason sometimes a screen. I, I will upload it. Oh, sorry. I will upload it uh, after we finish. If you agree, or I can send oh, the HTML sure. to you. It's extremely lean. Uh, oh, cool. It's no, not it doesn't matter. Online. I oh, fear sure. I no, would break no worries. the whole repo, <laughs> you know, just before the meeting, and that that it wasn't tempting. No worries. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think the video is a bandwidth thing on my end. Not. I think it was working. It just wasn't showing me. Cool. Um, 
Paul said he's going to stop the recording. So uh, yeah, I, I think now is a good time to wrap it up. Um, let's let's continue the conversation in the forum. And um, yeah, thanks again, uh, Octavio and Greg. Thanks for joining and presenting all this. Thanks for listening. We are eager to get your feedback on this. Yeah, yes. great. Thank you. Cool. Well, and thanks everyone for joining. Hopefully we'll see you all next month or uh, on Thursday on the dev calls. <laughs>